Hey everyone, welcome to the third episode of the Young Aussie Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm here with Brandon. Hello, Brandon. Hey, how you doing? Not too bad, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Come no, on. no problem, thank you. So, um, for anyone who doesn't know you, I don't know how they couldn't, because you're everywhere at the moment on YouTube. <laughs> um, your videos have been going viral lately. Did you want to tell people a bit about you? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name's Brandon. I run the Aussie Wealth Creation YouTube channel and uh, I've been running that channel for the last couple of years. Um, pretty much I started the channel just because I, I made like heaps of investing mistakes when I first started out because the channel's predominantly around uh, stock market investing. And so I eventually just made some videos to say, hey, look, these are the mistakes I made. So please don't make the same mistakes. And Turned out I hit kind of a bit of a niche being in the Aussie market. There weren't many Australian finance YouTubers. So uh, people started watching. So I was really happy and I just kept kind of making the content. I've been making two videos a week on the channel and um, it's kind of grown fairly well, especially in kind of 2019. So yeah, I'm just really enjoying making some stock market content, personal finance content uh, on YouTube. That's all. I mean, I've been following you for about half a year and your content this oh, right. few months has just been um crazy growth so congrats to you yeah thanks very much thanks it's, it's been i it's just been a lot of fun i think that's one of the things about you know people chasing growth with their business and stuff i feel like if you can just make it fun and yeah. you enjoy what you do i mean it's it, your enthusiasm just kind of naturally comes across and the success is waiting for you but yeah i'm just really enjoying it so yeah it's, it's good that it's kind of snowballed a little bit but yeah i think at the core it's just me having a good time really <laughs> not yeah, taking anything so what made you obviously you talked about how you made a few um investing mistakes which is why you wanted to educate people what sort yeah. of made you really niche down into specifically stocks and was it just from past experiences or you wanted to help people yeah well i guess to, to start out with i kind of finished uni and then my profession by trade i'm a physiotherapist yeah so i kind of started working as a physio and i was just like hmm you know, the, the, the amount of income growth, salary growth and that sort of thing that you can get as a physio is really not the best. So I kind of started looking <clears throat> at that time, <clears throat> excuse me, at kind of ways that you can snowball your money and that sort of stuff and start to really, you know, build some kind of just long-term wealth creation kind of streams, revenue streams. And then I was just reading up and obviously people invest in real estate and that sort of stuff. But then I came across stocks and I was like, oh, okay, this seems like it's doable with, you know, not a huge amount of capital to start out with. So started researching and I, I made like just all the classic beginner's mistakes. Like you see someone on TV and they're recommending the stock and you're like, oh yeah, like they've convinced me, let's buy that. And then sure enough, the stock goes down. You're like, oh, what the hell? And that sort of thing. Um, so that's when I kind of realized that actually investing isn't as easy as maybe what some people make it out to be. And, and um, from there, I just kind of started First of all, making yeah videos about how I kind of all the mistakes I made and trying to warn people not to make these mistakes. And then I really went in on kind of the Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger strategy, just spent heaps of time kind of researching how they go about looking at companies. And that's how I kind of developed my strategy that I've been, <clears throat> that I've been following for the last couple of years. So, yeah. So for those that don't know, you're, you're not actually a day trader. You spend a lot of time researching into companies for the long term. <laughs> yeah, pretty much all, everything that I do, I, I just, I don't concern myself with day trading. Um, I don't think it's bad or anything. Like yeah. if someone wants to be a day trader, they can, they can go for it. There are certainly a lot of successful day traders out there. But for me personally, um, I like the strategy of digging deep into a company, researching it kind of inside and out, and then making an investment for the long term because a lot of the times like even the most successful day traders will probably tell you that a lot of the time it, it's uh, it's a bit of a 50 50 as to whether stocks will go up or go down tomorrow and it mm. sometimes can be quite difficult to make money at a certain time if you know say you're in a recession or something like that i, I suppose you could short stocks but Overall, I don't like the stress and I don't like having to glue myself to a screen kind of every day and, yeah. and watch charts and oh, go in, go, get out, that sort of stuff. So for me, I'd rather find kind of businesses that I care about, research them in depth and then invest for the long term. Right. So you mentioned um, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. What have you learned from those two that you've sort of implemented into your research strategies? I think that 
the, the, they really have four pillars of investing. And that's the thing that I've really found, particularly from studying um, Charlie Munger. The kind of first pillar is that you've got to like understand the business, which I mean, just naturally makes sense. But it, I find it surprising at how many people buy into a stock without actually understanding what they've just bought. I mean, a lot of people buy stocks, they don't even understand that they're actually buying a part ownership in a company. So yeah. if you're a part owner in a company, you probably want to know what's going on in the company as best you possibly can. So understanding the business is something that I've really learned from those guys and something that I kind of really hone in on. Um, finding businesses with competitive advantages like moats and um, making sure like learning how to analyze management teams because obviously the management team is the, they're the people calling the shots in the company. So you want to have a management team with skill and integrity. And, uh, and the last thing, probably the most important thing is making sure you've got um, some level of margin of safety. So yeah. you're not buying the stocks at full retail. Yeah. So for you, is the focus on the number side of things in terms of market cap um, or is it more the structures of the business itself? Um, like how, how do I go about, what do I look at analysis wise and that sort of yeah. stuff? So is it more numbers that you look at in business like cash, like liquidation? Mm. I, I don't know too much about that or the actual structure. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's a, it's kind of even, it's a bit 50, 50. A lot of those categories kind of like moat, looking at the moat and looking at management it's kind of like it's it's quite qualitative to begin with like you've got to be able to identify what's a characteristic about this company that maybe gives it an advantage but then uh, same thing like with the management you've got to actually like qualitatively research into the management see you know are they trustworthy people but there's definitely the other side of it where once you've kind of done that initial <clears throat> qualitative analysis then you've got to go with the numbers so for instance a, a good way that i've found and that that you know, Buffett and those guys kind of use to assess whether a company has a good moat is to look at whether they have had uninterrupted growth of things like earnings per share or equity or cash flow, whether those numbers have grown steadily at above 10% per year over the long term and have pretty much not been interrupted. Like that makes sense that yeah. if those numbers grow really well over the long term and they don't get interrupted by anything, then the company probably isn't being interrupted by any of its competitors. So mm -hmm. In that instance, maybe it does have some sort of competitive advantage. So then you might, might look at business and go, okay, well, what is its competitive advantage? Does it have a really strong brand? Does it have a switching moat? Is it like Facebook where it's just so so successful because it's a massive network and like everyone's on there? So there's kind of both. You, I kind of look at both qualitative and quantitative. Yeah, so you're going for more the higher cap stocks that just have had consistent growth for a long period of time. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I do look at um, bigger stocks, um, higher market cap. Generally, it takes more to push them into bankruptcy. So kind of you can, I guess you can look at them as lower risk, but of course, at the same time, there, there's still obviously you can look at a company like Telstra. It's got a massive market cap, but there's some uh, interesting stuff going on in that business yeah. at the moment, which is sending it down. So um yeah, I tend to I tend to keep myself now, especially like I used to dabble in some more speculative, smaller companies. Um, but just with the size of the company being so small, like mm. just a little bump in the road is just like a massive mountain for some of those companies. Whereas something like a massive market cap stock, like I don't know, like Commonwealth Bank or something, or or over in the states, like Facebook or Apple, got like cash coming out of their ears and that sort yeah. of stuff. Then. Obviously, little bumps in the road, they're like, ah, oh, whatever, we can roll over this, no problems. Yeah. You talked about day trading, how, um, you know, being glued to the screen. And I think for a lot of day traders, it's 80% emotion, 20, um, just being able to handle emotion. When you're investing for the long term, <laughs> how do you handle your emotions when a stock may have a sudden dip or how do you handle that? Mm. It's, it is pretty hard. Um, I, like a lot of people just straight up just say, oh, as a great investor, you should detach yourself from your emotions and not invest emotionally. It was like, yeah, okay, easier said than done, right? Yeah. It's just like, um, if, you're, if you lost 10 grand tomorrow, you're probably going to feel pretty bad. <laughs> it's like, we're just humans. So the way that I kind of get around the emotion side of things is to really understand the business. Because if you understand the business, when you see some sort of negative news and maybe the stock is going down a lot more, you're going to have much better context and you're going to be able to understand like what that means for the business much better. Yeah. So I think that kind of firstly to kind of get over the emotion side of investing, 
Mm-hmm. You got to understand if you understand the company, it makes it much easier to understand when things go wrong or right, and kind of understand how it's going to be affected. Um, and but also just like when you do understand the business, it gives you an opportunity to kind of step back, especially with the mindset of a long-term investor. Because mm-hmm. if if you go with the mindset of like I'm not going to I'm going to make my investment, and if the stock market closed down for the next ten years, I wouldn't even care. Yeah. So it kind of puts things into perspective. If you can kind of yeah, good things and bad things. Are, are, you're going to you're going to see that pop up, and people are going to react. You're going to see positive and negative news. But if you remember that you understand this business and you're in it for the long term, then mm-hmm. even though you're still going to feel the emotions, you can kind of step step away from them a little bit because all of the investors out there are feeling the same emotions. So mm-hmm. you've got to be that that investor that kind of says, okay, I feel it too, but let's step away from that and think about it rationally and whether this is a problem that really is going to get this company into trouble, whether it's maybe just a small thing that they're going to get over and the market's overreacting. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. Have you ventured out into considering you know, real estate or businesses or is your main focus just on building this big stock portfolio over the long term with consistent growth? Um, I, I'm more focused in stocks at the moment just because I feel like I, I know yeah. the most about stocks. So I'm a big believer in kind of staying in your circle of competence. I think people make big mistakes if they start to chase bargains that are outside their circle of competence. Yeah. Um, it's all about understanding, like again, understanding what you're, what you're getting yourself into. So for me personally, like I'd really like to start investing in property um, I probably don't know enough about property. Um, all of pretty much with the channel and everything, we've just been focused for about two years. So I'm start like obviously you never stop learning. I'm starting to get a little bit more comfortable with stocks. Um, I feel like I've really honed my strategy down over the last year or so. So I'm certainly not like certainly not against looking at other asset classes and that sort of stuff for investment. Just for me personally, it's just about staying with what I know and yeah. not, yeah, not, not uh, pushing myself into the unknown is pretty much always ends in failure. <laughs> yeah. You've, um, you've built a pretty, how many subscribers are you at currently? Um, I don't know. It's because it's been, it's actually, I've had like this viral video that's been going on. Yeah. Every, I think it's, like 20, 20 something thousand and like if you rewind the clock like literally a month ago it was like less it was like sixteen thousand or something so i think it's about 20 or twenty thousand or something like that how was yeah. how has that gone with you building that such a big community around you has that has that influenced in any way the decisions you make with stocks do you look at what other people are suggesting in the wider community or i i used to and i caught it i i, I sort of thought originally like when I started the channel and a few people started watching they started saying hey have you checked out this stock I kind of thought oh that's that's actually might be a good kind of side bonus of having a channel is that I'll see what other people are are kind of interested in um but the the more you research it the more you realize that your best investments are going to be the ones that are firmly within your circle of confidence so for instance a lot of people over the last six months have been saying to me oh you should really look at the banks bank stocks are really cheap after the Royal commission and that sort of stuff. Like they're so cheap. You should look at, look at all of them. And like you hear that left, right and center. And for me, I just have like no interest in banks. So I know that if I even try and start researching the banks, I'm just going to fall asleep. So I don't really know much about bank stocks. So for me, that one just sits outside. So for me, that one's a pass, but it is interesting to kind of see what, I guess what, what I see from all these people like um, just saying, oh, have you checked out this stock and that stock? It kind of shows you just like what stocks are hot <laughs> yeah. and what stocks are cold at the moment. So it doesn't actually tell you anything about whether they're good investments or not, but it tells you what people are paying attention to anyway. That's a good point. You, you obviously help a lot of people through your videos. What has YouTube and, and the channel and base you've built done for you personally? How has it helped you, do you believe? Um, it's a good question. Um, it's certainly helped me uh, diversify what I do. So before I was very much focused on just doing my physiotherapy job. I did see a little bit of growth with the channel and I started, you know, as it grew more and more, I kind of put more, more time and effort into that. So it's kind of worked out for me that I've got, it kind of helps me diversify my income streams a little bit, which is nice. Um, it's also kept me sane a little bit at the same time. Like it's just, it's just good fun. Like, yeah. um, 
uh, I won't lie, like you work full-time hours. And for me personally, especially like seeing patients all day, um, just like 20 minute, 20 minute, 20 minute, 20 minute, it just keeps going and going and going. By the end, like towards the end of Friday, you're just so drained. So mm. being able to, you know, have a couple of different things to focus on and taking a little bit less time on physio, working as well on the YouTube channel, it's just nice to be able to do both things because I do like doing them both. I like mm. YouTube much more, but um, it's nice just to be able to, you know, come into the community. And, and on the whole, the community is really positive, obviously, like you experience the same with the YAE. So um, it's just nice to hear what people think and to be able to interact with people as well. It keeps you sane, keeps you grounded, keeps you down to earth. Yeah, definitely. So sort of longer term, 12, 24, 36 months from now, what sort of impact do you want to have with your channel? Uh, I really just want to reach as many people as possible. Okay. So like pretty much all of the, all the content I make is just about trying to educate so I pick topics that I feel like I can talk a bit about and that I know something about. Um, so I'm really just trying to just reach as many people as possible. Help, I, I especially want to focus on helping people start. Um, I feel like there's so many barriers to entry with investing, especially stock market investing. Yeah. A lot of people our age kind of grew up at the time, like we were kids when the GFC happened. So it's kind of like most millennials have this like negative view of the stock market. Like it's just a, a way to lose all your money. So trying to educate people, I guess that it's, it's really actually a powerful long-term wealth creation tool and yeah. uh, kind of just giving them the, the information that they need to form their own opinions and also to help them kind of get started in the stock mm -hmm. market. I think that's kind of where I'm, where I'm trying to go in the next kind of 12, 24 months or so yeah. and for you is that tapping into other markets like the us and or are you mainly focused on australia um i used to be more focused on australia because <laughs> of my channel name um but i've actually found with my strategy that i now use i find that more american companies fit the strategy because it's essentially the strategy is good at evaluating growth stocks and in Australia there aren't that many really strong growth stocks and because they're so few and far between they're always priced really really high for that growth like Afterpay is a great example um, it's like one of the most talked about growth stocks same A2 Milk was that growth stock like a year ago yeah. um, but in the US there's just like this stock this stock this there's so many growth stocks and plus in Australia when when a growth stock kind of reaches a certain level of maturity, there's a fair bit of pressure to start giving out dividends because obviously we've got our fully frank dividend system in Australia, which is a really good system. Um, so there's kind of limited opportunity, I suppose, in Australia. So yeah, I kind of look at the US a lot. Yeah. American business is performing pretty well. So Yeah, definitely. I noticed you got in on A2 Milk a while ago. It's very, very appealing. Yeah, yeah. Long time ago now. Yeah, I've actually sold out of A2 Milk. Um, yeah. Yeah, because again, that's that's one of the stocks that I was actually lucky with that because I kind of went into that one before I really nailed my circle of competence. So you ask me now with the, <laughs> Brandon, what do you care about? And I'm playing video games and, you know, sitting on Facebook and Instagram and obviously on YouTube and Google. And you say, hey, Brandon, do you have any interest in this milk company? <laughs> I'm kind of like, well, you know, I drink milk. But, uh, yeah, not really. So. I was like, that was kind of one of those ones that I had early days, which it did pay off. But um, yeah, yeah, if you ask me whether I start looking at that company today, I'd probably say probably not. <laughs> um, you did mention this before. You had that one video about match betting. How did you... Oh, uh, yeah. How do you create such viral content that just reaches... I think <laughs> last time I checked, it was a quarter of a million. I don't know. I, to be honest, like, I, I do not know how that happened. Um, it's It's purely algorithmic like that is just straight up the youtube the new <clears throat> that's straight up the youtube algorithm that's taking yeah. over um because i when i uploaded that video i just expected it to perform just as the other videos do maybe like a couple of thousand and then it just kept going up and of course it's just like that snowball as soon as it starts going up more it's got an even higher chance of snowballing even more which gives it a higher chance of snowballing even more and it just keeps going so it was a it was a weird kind of experience to have that viral video because like if you look at that video it's got something like over 300,000 views which is yeah. like ridiculous but then my next best has only got like 40,000 so it's kind of like yeah it's a big big difference so it's pure like there's nothing I 
something about that. It's, I didn't, yeah, I didn't like pay for views or anything. It's, yeah. it's just the YouTube algorithm just takes it and it starts snowballing. But I'll what, take it. <laughs> what's that video done for you? Have you seen drastic changes since you released that video, or has it just been? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting, actually. I, I didn't kind of know what to expect, but. On the whole, having those kind of viral videos, it makes all of your other content get more views as well. Yeah. So I found that really interesting. Like not just views on that video, but views on every other video as well has kind of yeah. gone up, um, which has been really interesting. It kind of happened in waves. So there was kind of like, if you look at the views graph, that it kind of went up a little bit, then dropped back down, then it went up again, dropped back down, then it spiked up to the highest point, And now it's kind of fizzed out now. Um, so it was kind of really interesting how that, that happened but yeah it certainly um certainly brought in a lot more subscribers which is yeah. kind of strange uh, but i guess it's just like uh, it's just like the law of averages i suppose because i think before that i was getting i don't know maybe a thousand subscribers new subscribers every month and just with that one video um last month was six thousand so yeah. it's like it's yeah fun, funny numbers yeah really crazy for anyone sort of, yeah well, i mean for anyone sort of looking to start a youtube channel are there any tips or growth hacks that you use when you were starting or you now know? Um, I don't know about growth hacks. I've kind of just kept plowing away. And yep. um, you do have to, I, the, the tips that I would give, the biggest tips is if you're going to start a YouTube channel, there's potential there, but make sure whatever you do, you enjoy doing it yep. because you are not going to get any money out of it for a long time. Mm. So it's a, it's a great way to kind of build up a personal brand and, and a following that sort of stuff that, go into it just with the mindset of, I want to make these videos because I care about this topic that I'm making videos about. So definitely like what you do, um, stay consistent. The YouTube algorithm reward consistency. So I've pretty much uploaded two videos a week for two years straight, pretty right. much without fault. So it, YouTube really rewards consistency. We're seeing a couple of YouTubers uh, in the finance space that have taken some time off um, and then they've come back in and their views have been like a tenth of what they were previously. So it does definitely rewards consistency. Um, and just, uh, just be, be different, I, I guess. So I was kind of lucky when I started out that there were lots, there were still lots of personal finance channels out there, but there mm. weren't any Australian ones or none that I knew of anyway. And I still don't really know of any. Um, but so that kind of gave me a point of difference, but right. um, make sure that the content that you make is, is different. Um, different in some way. It doesn't have to be like radically different, but I don't know, give your own flair to your videos and your own perspective and your own personality and um, yeah. they're consistent. Yeah. Pick a niche. Um, just be different and keep, keep, I think a lot of people, they go for volume of content over quality of content. So that's one thing that I kind of promised myself is that the videos that I made on YouTube to would be, as high, give, they would give as high as much value as possible to the person watching it, um, and I would do that before I thought about how many videos I could make. Yeah. So I guess it's just like if if, if you made a video, it's like, hey, um, tip tip, you know, money saving tip, and then they click on the video and it says, uh, turn off your lights when you're not using them. It's just like, uh, all right, great. But if you made a video where it's just like twenty simple tips to help you save more than a hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Well, a video like that is, is going to give someone real value as opposed yeah. to the first example where you're just like, do this and give me a view, but I don't actually care about you very much. <laughs> so do you see different changes when you obviously you do a lot of stock analysis videos, when you deviate from those and do money making tips or do you see different patterns of um, the people in the audience that you're tapping into and different views and is it all yeah. good? Yeah. Yeah. I, I try not to get hung up on the numbers too much. I think yeah. that's the problem with YouTube is that you, you've got your analytics there every second of every day and they're yeah. constantly updating. So it's like, Oh my gosh, people can get glued to the analytics. Um, but like, I think that the gen, like I always keep it inside of personal finance, like no matter what I do, definitely people know me best for doing investing videos. Um, so those in investing videos get most of the most views and that sort of stuff. And generally people respond best to them. Yeah. Um, but like, it's, it's good to mix it up really. Like people like to see things that are fresh. I'm sure like it, when I do individual stock breakdowns, they tend to get a fair amount of views, but I'm sure if I did that week in week out, 
that number probably wouldn't last. So like, it's good. Like in the last little while I've talked about like capital raising and then I've done what my personal investing plan is. And we did a live podcast and then I did a Q and a, I talked about, I tried to do some reselling. So it's still all in that umbrella of personal finance, but I do like to just mix it up. And I, I think that keeps people, I don't know, interested. Yeah. And obviously, like you mentioned, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing. Do you reach into your audience for video suggestions or is it always coming from your mind and your creativity? No, no. I, um, like everyone, I hit writer's block sometimes. So in those times, I definitely just reach out to people like on Instagram or I'll, I'll add it to the end of a video and just say, hey, you know, what, what do you want to hear? So yeah, yeah. I, a lot of the times I, I just try and assess what's what's popular, I guess, at the moment and what's kind of making headlines and, and what people might find interesting and kind of give people that maybe don't follow stock market news all that closely, I kind of give them, you know, if they, if they watch my channel consistently, they'd kind of be up to speed with most things that are going on, perhaps. Yes. Um, and so I kind of think about it that way. I just, at the end of the day, I make video that, um, make videos that people want to see. So their suggestions and I just make videos that I want to make as well. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. I, I know you've done a lot of stuff with Hamish as well. How has that leverage, um, helped you as in, you know, working with different audiences, not necessarily your own? Yeah, I, I tend to, I tend to just, um, collaborate and do that sort of stuff just because I want to, yeah. um, I, I try not to get hung up on, you know, is this working out for me? Is this working out for you? And that sort of stuff. Like, for instance, ha Hamish, I first noticed Hamish because he was another Australian guy and he was investing the same way that I was. Yeah. We have very, very similar investing strategies. So, yeah, to find another person that's like that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, was, was really awesome. I, I never, I didn't think that I'd find someone in Australia that, would make YouTube videos specifically in the same method that I follow my investing as well. So that was really good to kind of start doing the podcast with him and yeah, it gives people variety. They can kind of listen to it on the go and that sort of stuff. But on the, yeah, on the podcast, we've kind of just had different guests. Um, and there, there's always that element <clears throat> of being able to bring new people in from other people's audiences. But at the same time, it's just, it's good. It's really good to have other people on because you get to hear so many different, perspectives and opinions and, and different ways of doing it. Like we had um, Gally Russell on the podcast who absolutely knows Tesla stock inside out and back to front. So he, he was great to talk about because me and Hamish both love that company. Yeah. Whereas we talked uh, recently to Sven Carlin who runs a YouTube channel as well. And he's got a really extensive background in uh, finance. Same with uh, Richard Coffin from the plain bagel. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's kind of more or less, we just kind of reach out to people that we think would, we'd like to talk to and, and same, same, I just like reach, reach out to people that I, I want to talk to really. <laughs> yeah. I noticed you're on Instagram as well. Um, any other yep. platform? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's mainly Instagram. Um, I do have a Facebook page, but I, I seem to forget to update it. <laughs> yeah. Is that important for you to be spread across different platforms? Uh, it, it is, I think it's, it will be important in the future, it's always good to like diversify your audience if you can have them in a couple of different places. But um, yeah, like at the moment, it's so one-sided to YouTube that yeah. um, kind of hard to keep up. Like I know I should be focusing more on growing Instagram as well, but at the end of the day, one minute that I spend on YouTube is going to be far more effective than one minute I spend on Instagram. So I think that it's, there's definitely value in having diversification across different platforms yeah um so yeah i try and target instagram i feel like instagram is the is the trendy one at the moment but um yeah in terms of like active users youtube is where it's at in terms of video content so yeah, yeah youtube um, instagram facebook page um, i need to be better on facebook and i did have a snapchat but i just don't i just don't use it anymore yeah um Obviously, you mentioned you're still working your job and um, trading in YouTube as well. Pretty mm. cool that you have there. Is YouTube something, yep. you, at least your personal brand, something you plan on taking full time eventually? Uh, hopefully. Hopefully one day. I mean, YouTube doesn't pay very well. Yeah. <laughs> so you gotta, you got to get the bills paid at the end of the day. But um, it's getting to a point now, especially over the last couple of months, where you can really see that potential. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've kind of got a couple of things in the pipeline. So hopefully we can focus on it a bit more full time because 
like as I said before, I do really enjoy doing the YouTube stuff. So I more like my ideal world would just be wake up, <laughs> be able to make a day's worth of content, you know, research into some stocks, make some videos because I just want to have as much time to do that sort of stuff as possible. Because obviously you have more time, you can research further, you make high quality content, you make more content, that sort of stuff. So it would even help growth out too. So yeah, overall, I would, I would like to do it full time. Maybe I will one day, but um, mm -hmm. got to pay the bills at the same time. <laughs> yeah, of course. Do you, um, you obviously have a great influence over people and um, people love you. Do you feel some obligation to constantly help people and be there that personal finance guide in Australia for them? Yeah, a little bit, actually. Um, you kind of really get, when you start, I guess when you start growing a bit, you really get spurred on by the comments um, and people, you can't, you get really nice comments, which yeah. is fantastic. People like, you know, telling you how, how much they find your videos useful and you hear stories about how people have used your content to actually start investing. So they've actually begun that wealth creation process and it, it definitely, the, the power of numbers really drives you once it does start growing and you start getting those messages more frequently. It's like, yeah, like people do actually kind of care about this. It's not just me kind of talking to a camera and putting on the internet, walking away. So it definitely is a big driver for me. I, I definitely, um, I don't know, rally behind those comments and try and um, make as much good content as possible, I guess. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, because even there's a lot of potential for you to even go into events and speaking events there's just it helps yeah yeah something i'd be interested in if anyone wants to invite me so yeah for sure man for sure but yeah. there's just, me up, I'll, I'll come up. for anyone obviously you touched on the the methods to grow before for anyone um looking to start a youtube channel build a personal brand start a business get into stocks what's your sort of tip for just getting started or doing um just getting started just be like be consistent and give a lot of value try try not to be um try not to be in it for the wrong reasons try not to be um that person that is just out there to make a million dollars yeah um, i think that the real the, the key to be to building a personal brand is to be like a, a, a real person just to be like honest and and to be thoughtful and um, and to care about your customers uh, yeah. who are your followers I guess and I think that the best thing you, you can possibly do when you're starting out is try and jam whatever you do with as much value as possible mm -hmm. um, if you do that you'll get the reward for it eventually yeah um, and that's kind of the mentality that I've adopted with some of this YouTube stuff, especially early days where you're getting paid literally. I make two videos a week and I get paid 12 cents for the month. Yeah. It's like, well, <laughs> it's not a great hourly rate. But at the same time, like, no, this, this stuff is helping people. And just try and think of it, think of it maybe as you're getting, you'll get paid later. Yeah. You'll get paid later for what you do. So don't stress about the money. Just do, do what you like. Be consistent add value that sort of stuff I, I think that's the recipe yeah and i think i think your personal stock investing strategy of comp like focusing on the long term and that compound growth over mm. time is a perfect yeah. example for anyone starting in business or anything for that matter yeah 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 definitely i mean just yeah like what you do with with investing yeah you can think about it like in terms of business i mean understand what you're doing where you're going set mm -hmm. it up right keep chipping away understand give value you get there eventually yeah yeah definitely well for anyone who's listening um where can they find you on youtube your channel name and instagram and all that sort of thing? yes um pretty much just youtube is aussie wealth creation um two to three videos a week, as we've been talking about, just on, on personal finance. Yep. Um, podcast that we run um, every Saturday is called The Young Investors Podcast. That's myself and Hamish Hodder. Yep. Um, so you can check that out on YouTube and Spotify and iTunes and that sort of stuff. And, um, and yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Aussie Wealth Creation again. Um, and yeah, that's where I'm at on online. Perfect. I'll drop those links below for anyone who awesome. wants to follow you. I'm sure... Um, people would love your content and, and they already do. Yeah.
Thank you. Yeah, come over. Yeah. Say hello. Say yeah. hello. See that Reese sent you so I know who's come across. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Brendan. I've learned a lot that I'm going to start implementing in with what I do. Um, really yeah. appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming on and keep doing what you're doing as well. Like, I really enjoy following the group on Facebook. So, yeah, keep it up. I'm Very following good. closely. Yeah. Thanks so much. No worries. Thanks for having me.